and turn to our opening text in John chapter 8, verse 2. I'd like to share with you tonight three very simple truths. Number one, everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And anything is possible. Turning to our opening text in John chapter 8, verse 2, here we find these same three truths. And we're just going to read the, the very first verse as we, we follow the story throughout the rest of this evening. This first verse sets the stage, much like the stage that's been set here tonight. John chapter 8, verse 2 says, And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and he taught them. If we brought this into today's context, it would say Jesus was at church teaching and preaching to those who wanted to hear, much like we've gathered here tonight. And so with that, would you pray with me? Would you ask that that same voice of God that spoke in the temple that day would speak to our hearts and minds here? Jesus, we came for you. We came to hear from your word, God, for your spirit to speak to us individually and collectively, God. And I pray that your will would be done here, that your word would come alive, that that same voice, the voice that was the beginning and then the end, the Alpha and Omega, the, the one true God, that's you, Jesus, that you would speak to us here in this place. Amen. You may be seated. If you're a guest in the house tonight, um, the title of this message is for you. Everyone's welcome. Um, in October of uh, 2021, you may or may not have noticed, if, depending on if you tune into the news, that uh, a large company called Facebook decided that they were going to change their name from Facebook to Meta. It was last fall. And, but even before this announcement, the word meta had already actually become very popular, or, uh, very popular in culture today. And so depending on how cool you are, you may or may not have picked up on that. Um, but long before even pop culture picked up on this word meta, it's been used for the past 20 years by developers to describe keywords that are used to index search results. Uh, they call those words metadata. The definition of the word meta from Webster's Dictionary is an explicit awareness of itself or oneself as a member of its own category or something that's cleverly self-referential. Let me give you an example of a statement that is clearly self-referential. If I was to tell you, my greatest fear is fear itself, that's very meta, self-referential. My greatest fear is fear itself. Now, I'm not confessing that to you, but if I was, that, that would be one of those things. As we read in John chapter 8, the setting of our opening text was an early morning church service that took place some 2,000 plus years ago. There's, there's something very meta here tonight in the house of God as we have a lesson that started as teaching in the house of God about teaching in the house of God. You see the self-referential nature of this portion of scripture. If we took the time to look through the, the meta lens, I imagine there are many self-referential principles within the scriptures. Think about it. We are the church reading about the church. That's pretty meta. So as we read about ourselves, ourselves being the church, let's be careful not to put too much distance between us now and them back then because this is us. In this setting in church where Jesus was teaching, the scriptures go on to say that some holier-than-thou type of churchgoers came to that church that morning with the intent to, to disrupt, to distract. This group of pious men made a huge ruckus. They created a scene. They, they forcibly drug a woman into where Jesus was trying to teach. I'm thankful that I've never witnessed anything like that in this place, but John chapter 8, verse 3, as we continue to read this portion of scripture, it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in an adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. 
But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as if he had heard not. Now, based on Jesus' reaction here, it's, it's safe to assume that, that the people that Jesus was previously teaching had decided it's time to leave, the service is over, something's going on, I don't want to be a part of it. And now Jesus is alone with this, this group of troublemakers. And he gave this group the cold shoulder. He, he straight up ignored that they were even there. Seemingly more interested in whatever it was he was writing on this dusty floor. In John chapter 8, verse 7, it says, So when they continued asking him, as he, as he gave them the cold shoulder, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. Back to what he was doing before, giving them only a few words. And I, I can only imagine the, uh, the outrage or the dumbfoundedness of those men thinking to themselves, who is this strange teacher, preacher? What is he doing? He's writing on the floor with his finger. But, but even as they were outraged, even as they were dumbfounded, I, I, I got to imagine human nature said, I wonder what it is he's, he's writing. What, what could be so much more important than what we've got right here going on? The Bible doesn't say what Jesus wrote. <clears throat> Many have imagined that Jesus wrote a list of the sins these men committed, and perhaps maybe there was things that were of a very personal nature and specific enough to be recognized that they could see themselves, or, or maybe it was the law that was being written, or whatever it was, regardless of what it was, conviction spoken by God himself or the reality of being faced with one's own sin, there was a sudden change in their mindset, and they started showing themselves the door. John chapter 8 verse 9 explains that and they these these troublemakers when they heard it being convicted by their own conscience they went out one by one beginning at the eldest and even unto the last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst and when Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman he said unto her woman where are those thine accusers hath no man condemned thee she replies to Jesus no man lord and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Tonight we continue on this theme that his spirit always works. This precious promise that his divine nature will ever become our divine nature or our nature, his nature in us. And since Jesus is that head cornerstone, that Jesus is the pattern or example of what his spirit working in us will look like, that pattern will always make sure that everyone who wants to hear feels welcome. Understanding that nobody is perfect except Jesus. And that this pattern that Jesus displayed will be resonant in his body of true believers. Because when you combine an open door that welcomes anyone with an understanding that nobody's perfect, well then we get an environment where anything can happen. I recognize that uh, sometimes I may try to cram a little too much into uh, some sermons. Not going to get an amen on that? All right. But tonight's not one of those messages. Uh, sometimes less is more. And so I've, I've come to remind this body of believers and myself, ourselves, with, with these three very simple truths. Everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And anything can happen. While our opening text in itself does not highlight mankind's greatest achievements or attributes, the story does capture the essence of these three truths. Truth number one, that everyone is welcome, is, is played out multiple times throughout the story because as the scene unfolds, as we mentioned, Jesus was teaching in the temple. And, and so first we had a, a group of churchgoers, people who wanted to be there, people who wanted to receive the information, the words of life. Today we'd call those faithful saints. Second, we had a similar but different set of churchgoers who saw themselves as holier than thou. Uh, they were the holiness police, you might say. They, they came to enforce the standards. People whose intentions were headed in the right direction, but they were missing the most important ingredient. They were missing that love of God working inside their hearts, shed abroad in their heart by the Holy Ghost. Turn to Galatians 
chapter 5, verse 13, if you would, with me. And here we read about those who, who started well, they, not being backslid and still attending church. They might even be considered faithful saints, but somehow they've run low on the Holy Ghost, the power of God working in us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, uh, speaks to this condition. It says, For brethren, ye have not been called unto liberty, only not use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love to serve one another. Jesus didn't free us from our sin and, and make us part of this uh, glorious kingdom so that we could just enjoy it for ourselves, but that we could be servants one to another, that we could fulfill the law with one word, that is, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. And then in, the, in verse 16, we, we read another one of these precious promises. It says, here's the guarantee. Then I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You might remember the other week we talked about you can't serve two masters. You, you, you will always be serving one or the other. The true servants of God will always in themselves reproduce true holiness, not out of their own abilities or, or choices, but as much as out of the ability and power of God's Spirit working in them. It's a precious promise. And since this is a Spirit-filled church, there ought to be evidence of that Spirit in, in that we don't bite each other's heads off. If you bite and devour each other, take heed. Take heed means to be warned. Can I tell you it's a warning signal that you're not doing well spiritually if you find yourself criticizing your brothers and sisters in the Lord? It should be an alarm, an alert that says something might not be right with me. I know from my own personal experience this is true. If I look back in time, those times when I started to uh, dwell on the faults of others... Or worse, if I started to speak about them, other people's issues, the problem wasn't them. The problem was me. You see, what I'm talking about here tonight, this, 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 this mindset is different than what 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 instructs us. There are times when that we are to identify those who walk disorderly, and the Bible says to withdraw from them. This is different than that. This is putting ourselves in a place of judge and jury when the bible says to take heed or be warned it's referring to people who put down others with their words and their actions in an attempt to pull themselves up oftentimes this 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 approach comes from a need even to ease their own guilt whether it's unconsciously or subconsciously our, our flesh is programmed with all sorts of ways in which it wants to um, take care of itself And so we need, to, we need to recognize the warning signs when we start to think or even worse, speak. Because God's Spirit always works. And if there's words or thoughts that are contrary to that, then we need to evaluate what's going on because it's not those other people that we're pointing at that have the problem. Everyone's welcome here. You know, it's interesting that God uses um, a sign that's very clear and obvious when you're filled with the Spirit. The Bible says that um, as evidence of that Spirit dwelling in us, there will be words spoken in a language that we never learned, like in the upper room in the book of Acts when the church was born. Wednesday night, we, we saw evidence of individuals being filled with the Spirit, and there was no question. You didn't have to wonder. It's a sign. God also uses another very clear and obvious sign called the fruit of the Spirit. So if, if speaking in tongues is the evidence of receiving the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is evidence that the Spirit is still operating in our lives after we've been born. Now as we continue to read from Galatians chapter 5, but now dropping into verse 22, here's a description of that evidence. Here's the precious promise of what will come as we walk in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live or if we've been born in the Spirit, let us also walk or be orderly in obedience in the Spirit. The Bible says that the Spirit of God working on us, in us is so powerful 
that it will actually cause us to love one another. John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, this love will be such a clear and obvious sign that we'll know we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Turn, if you would, with the 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Here God leaves no room for, for interpretation or misinterpretation. First John chapter 4, verse 20 says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Because his spirit always works. Precious promise. And this commandment have we from him that he who loved God loved his brother also. Church, we have to guard our hearts, our emotions, our thoughts. We have to protect the love that God has given us one for another. These last few weeks, we've been speaking about these precious promises of God that his spirit always works, that, that God is just looking to reproduce himself in us, and that really is our ultimate goal, and heaven is our reward for being a part of the process. Now, here's the good news. You could, you could be born into this kingdom today, and, and if that trumpet sound, you would get the same reward as those who have been in the process for many years. The, the difference isn't how far you've gotten in the process. The difference is, are you still in the process? Have you submitted to the process? God is so sure about this end result of his spirit working in us that John chapter 13 verse 35 says that all mankind will know the true church by the love they have one for another. He's so certain that it will reproduce himself in us that he says, this is how you'll know if they're the real deal. Pastor, I, I thought it was the sign we put out front that told them that we were the real deal, that they would know this is the place. I mean, we, we, we even have different messages we can send them to Tell them, right here, this is it. No, the sign is the love. A supernatural love, a love that does not come from our own thoughts and minds, but the power of God working in us. We have a guarantee that God's spirit in us will reproduce himself. And the Bible also warns that in order to, to grab a hold of that promise, we actually have to be full of the spirit. So there's a measure of God's spirit that we need to overcome our own human nature that, that doesn't just automatically show up or, or maintain itself without some, some effort, some steps of obedience. Because you can be filled with the spirit of God and not be full of the spirit of God. In the book of Acts chapter 6, the church was growing so rapidly, there was, there was, there was so much need for uh, help. The disciples asked the congregation, Here's what I need you to do. I need you to go amongst yourselves and find seven among you that are full of the Holy Ghost. I thought we were all filled with the Holy Ghost. We all, right? we all spoke in tongues. We all got baptized. No, no, we're talking about full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you were filled, yes, but are you full? Go find seven who are full of the Holy Ghost so that we can point them over the, over the business in the churches. So the Word of God says that you can be full. Well, that also implies you can be less than full. Now we can see this principle of fullness versus not in the parable of the ten virgins as well. The Bible says it as giving an example of the church and, and we being the church, the bride, and God being the groom. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb that's, that, that we're just waiting to, to be called to, to meet him in the clouds. And those that were waiting to, to meet the Lord Jesus in the air to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, there were ten that were filled with the Holy Ghost oil. They all had the power of God working in them. Every one of them was preparing for the wedding. They all started full with the, the full light of God, spirit burning bright in them. But when the time came for the marriage supper of the Lamb, five of the ten were not full enough of oil to find their way to the groom. So you, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost and not be full at the same time. So how do we stay full? How do we maintain this gift, this precious gift, well, turn, with, if you would, with me to Jude chapter 1, verse 20. Well, Jude, Jude and 20. Jude, verse 20. There's a very simple way. This is one simple way to stay full. Simply by praying in the Spirit, speaking in tongues. Jude chapter, or Jude, verse 20 says, But ye beloved, 
building yourselves on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Ghost. And what does that do? It keeps yourselves in the love of God. So that as we're looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, we'll be ready, we'll be full, we'll have oil in our lamps. Now just drop down to verse 24. Here's one of those guarantees that God's Spirit always works. It's in the same context. Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Ghost. What does that do that keeps you in the love of God so you're ready? Verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. He's guaranteed success. No, not perfection. He's guaranteed success. He, he's guaranteed that if you will do, I will give you the ability to overcome and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God is able to do that which he has promised. He has not left anything out that we need. It. But being filled with the Holy Ghost is not the same as being full of the Holy Ghost. So while, while all of this is true and good, right, you might be scratching your head while wondering, well, how does this relate to everyone is welcome? Well, you see, everyone is welcome comes from when our lamps are full. It's, it's, there's not a sign on our door that says everyone's welcome. That, 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 that wouldn't cut it. It has to come from within. It has to come from a place not manufactured by man, but, but God's spirit. Where anyone is welcome, not just in words, not just in a smile and a handshake, but in, a, in something they feel when they come through those doors. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost overflowing so that it says everyone is welcome. And then no matter who walks through those doors, they'll know they're welcome. They're welcome here whether they're filled with God's love or if they're running low on oil. They're welcome here if they come once a week or once in a while. They're welcome here no matter what circumstances preceded it. Do you know what? They're even welcome here if they came for the wrong reasons. Because I would have to put myself in that category as someone who came for the wrong reasons. I had no good intentions. I, I, did not, I was not seeking God when I walked through those doors, but when I walked through those doors, there was a welcome that I felt. I've told the story before, but, and some of you were here. That, that first Sunday, I, I came into church to sit next to a girl. I still sit next to her, by the way. And that first day, I... I I remember I came in, I had a big black eye, and, and if you saw me, you would have said, you look like trouble. <laughs> I mean, it was all over my face. I looked like trouble. <laughs> but you know what? Nobody gave me the stank eye. Nobody, nobody. You know what I got? I got, I got a lot of warm welcomes, a lot of genuine love, and a lot of interest in me to the point where I actually said, something's wrong with these people. It was the love of God shed abroad in their hearts because everyone is welcome. I mean, Pastor, it was your daughter. You should have known better. <laughs> right? If anyone should have given me the stank eye, it should have been you. But you didn't. Sister Schumacher, you, you didn't shake your head and say, oh my, what are we going to do with this? I, this is... And well, they said, hey, we're glad you're here. Everyone is welcome. You know, reconsidering our open text with this group of scribes and Pharisees, there was a, there, there was a type of person in that that was a troublemaker. Uh, but in a different way, they, they actually were a troublemaker with the intent to disrupt and distract. But can I say, even those who come sometimes with the wrong agenda to disrupt and, and distract are welcome here. Because even if you come with the wrong agenda, if you're here, now you're here, and now God has an opportunity to touch you. Whereas before, when you weren't here, the opportunity was less. See, God is so good at being God, he can actually use your wrong intentions to bring something to come to pass in your life that you weren't even asking for or looking to get, to come in contact with greater truth. I wonder how many people, maybe even someone here tonight, came to a spirit-filled church the first time because they, their loved one was going to this church and they were worried about this crazy doctrine that they heard them talking about and so they were coming to, to protect them from this thing and, and next thing you know they got exposed to truth and got a revelation of who Jesus is and 
came with wrong intentions, but even the wrong intentions are welcome here. If you're here for the right reasons, that is great. If you're here for the wrong reasons, that is great. It doesn't matter what brought you here. The most important thing is that you're here, and that since you're here, let me tell you, God wants to do a work in your life. Yeah. Lastly, within our opening text, we have, a, we have another profile, another person, a person who, who was literally dragged to church against their own will. If that's you tonight, you don't have to raise your hand. God already knows who you are, and he brought you here on purpose. And so, no matter your situation, I want you to know that you're welcome here. Because anyone and everyone can walk through those doors, bringing with them any type of situation, any challenge in life, and walk out those doors forgiven and filled with the Holy Ghost, a child of the Almighty God, in an instant. You see, you don't even have to really understand how it all works. I mean, God wants you to understand. He said, you know, knowledge is valuable and you will receive knowledge and this is a place to receive it. But if you're here tonight, you don't understand how it works. You don't have to understand how it works to become part of the kingdom. But you do have to take some step. You, 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 doing nothing will produce nothing. And since you're here, doing something will, will definitely produce something in response. And the Bible says that while you don't have to understand everything, you do have to actually call on the name of the Lord. There, there's something that has to be spoken, some, something that has to be thought, some intent that says, I think I want to do what's right. Romans chapter 10 verse 12 says, For there is no difference between Jew or Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If, if we're willing to take a step of faith just to simply speak something to God, in whatever words we have to say, those spoken words are enough to qualify us to become part of this promise. Everyone is welcome here. But none of us are perfect. You know, sometimes people are, 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 are looking, uh, and especially if they relocate to a new area for a, a church to attend. And if, if when you're thinking of that church, you're looking for the perfect church, let me just save you some time, you'll, you'll never find it. Because churches have people in them. And so therefore there is no perfect church because there's no perfect people. There's only one that's perfect, his name is Jesus. And while he's our, our prototype, the, the pattern which we are aligning our lives to, we are ever aspiring to, to his perfection, never achieving it, not in this life. Oh, there's going to come a day when we exchange this mortal flesh for something immortal, but until that day, we're all in the same pool together. There, there is no stacking order. We are all in the process of being saved. Nobody's perfect. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the moment we get all judgy and high-minded, we ought to take a look in the mirror and reflect on what God has saved us from, what he's done in our lives, his mercy and his long-suffering for us. And then we ought to extend that same love and long-suffering to those that, that come through the doors to others because nobody's perfect. Turn your Bibles, if you would, with me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. First John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin... If we put ourselves in a place of judgment on others, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Because if the truth was in us, his spirit always works. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There you go. If we start to look outwards, the, 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 the answer is to look inwards and confess, I think there's something in me, God. I need to... To, to rectify, I need to confess, I need to repent. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The only people self-righteous Christians are fooling is themselves. Can I tell you, the more a person has to tell you how holy they are, the less holy they are. 
You see, our flesh knows, and when our flesh knows that we're short on, on the Holy Ghost oil, what tends to happen is our flesh wants to, to put something in its place to try to counteract what we know we are short of. And in an attempt to convince ourselves, we, we portray things or advertise our holiness. Can I tell you, the more that we feel compelled to advertise our spirituality, the, the more we ought to look at our spirituality to find out what's going on. You know, the Bible says that they'll know you by the love you have one for another, but not by the things that you say or do or post. The woman that was dragged to church against her own will was not perfect, but she wasn't pretending to be perfect either. You know, we, we, we deal in truth, God deals in truth, and when we become truthful with him about ourselves, well, then all of a sudden things start to happen. And now that she was at church, even against her own will, the God of mercy is right there ready to meet her. Can you imagine? You've got people who want to be there that are being taught by Jesus, and you've got people who, who think they're somebody that come with the wrong agenda, and they, they want to disrupt, and, and then they leave, and, and the only one that's left is the person who didn't want to be there at all, and now she is being saved from her sins. <laughs> Anything is possible here tonight. With great confidence and assurance, I can tell you that nobody walks through those doors by coincidence. Never, never, ever. And whoever walks through those doors needs to feel the, the welcome and the love of the Holy Ghost in us. You see, you, you can smile and you can shake hands, but anyone can do that. But when there's this love of God in us, there's a, a patience and a hopefulness and, a, and an enduring already to those people that we don't even know just simply because they've crossed paths with us and God overflows. There are no coincidences in the kingdom of God. And so if they walk through that door, something is already planned, even if they came with the wrong intentions or agenda. And so with great confidence, while that's true, I can also tell you that we are all sinners in the process of being saved. None of us are saved as of yet. Yes, we're dead to our wrong cho choices and repentance. Yes, we're covered in his blood through baptism and having received the down payment of our inheritance that his spirit in us, we have all these things, but we are not yet perfect. We are in the process of being perfected and we are not in a place to judge anyone except ourselves. Everyone is welcome nobody's perfect and so then with great confidence again i can tell you if those two things exist anything can happen a miracle is ready to happen in this place here tonight you know it, there's there's this room is filled with miracles it's a miracle any one of us are here that, that any one of us would find this truth that any one of us would would become obedient to it, that any one of us would continue to walk in this way, that, that what are the chances? But because any one of us are here now, anyone else could be here too. See, the Bible says that when Jesus paid the price for the sin of the world, when he paid the price for my sin, he prepaid it. So that whosoever could, would. There, are, there is no one that he hasn't prepaid the price for their sin. It's just a question of have you accepted the payment or not. In our opening text, this woman who was caught in the act of adultery, she suddenly was in church and now delivered by Jesus herself. The scripture promises that that same spirit that's at work will reproduce himself in us. It's a guarantee from God. As we wind down here tonight, I want to bring our attention back to this, this theme that we've been reading. And we've read the scripture uh, numerous times, but, but I want to read it again and share a few more verses in it. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, is the, this promise of uh, all things have been given unto us that we need for God. And Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, this is where we get into the, the precious promise that we'll be partakers of his divine nature. And so, reading again, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, according to as his divine power has given us unto all things that pertain unto life and godliness, 
everything that we need to be successful is available. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and unto virtue, whereby we are given us exceeding great and precious promise. Here's the promise, that ye may be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in, the, that is in this world through lust. Now, keeping our Bibles open here to 2 Peter chapter 1, we're, we're, we're continuing on this theme of this precious promise, the guarantee of an expected end. But that guarantee of a, an expected end, that success in the kingdom of God, is, is not a free pass. It's a promise in response to our obedience. His spirit is reproduced in us when we take steps of faith, when we put our belief and our trust in God into action. As an example, you took a step of faith to be here tonight, being obedient to the scripture that says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Being obedient to the scripture that says, to present yourself a living sacrifice, lifting holy hands, bringing the sacrifice of our lips that is our praise. We, we've been doing all these things tonight in obedience to the word of God because we believe the word of God and we have trust in it, and so we've taken actions in obedience based on that word. And any step we take, whether it's a big step or a little step in obedience to the word of God, there's an exchange that takes place where we exchange our nature for his divine nature. Tonight, as the musicians come, as we continue to read in verse 5, this portion of scripture then describes the attributes. Here's the evidence of his divine nature working in us. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 goes on to describe the outcomes of this process of exchange of our nature for his nature. It says, and besides this, besides these precious promises, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You know, the moment we start to look down on others, we've forgotten that God has purged us from our own sins. Whether rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. It, there is a guarantee here. If you will do these things, you shall never fall. Church, God said, here's a guarantee, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God has already provided everything that we need to become like him. Nothing has been withheld. And if we'll walk in the spirit, the Bible says, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh because you can only serve one master. And if the nature of God, also known as the fruit of the spirit, being you, then you don't have to worry about stumbling because the Bible says you'll never fall again. It's not a theory. It's, it's not a concept, it's a fact. It, these things abound, you shall never fall. God's spirit will ever produce greater levels of faith, ever increasing amounts of virtue, things that will be multiplied through the knowledge of his word and demonstrated in real life as temperance or self-control. This inner work of the spirit will show up on the outside as patience, love, long-suffering, an ever increasing amount of godliness, And all of these things, when applied to one's life, will be seen by others. Acts of kindness, demonstrating love for one another. He's so sure of it, he said, this is the sign they will see. They'll see the love. And because his divine nature is now manifest in us, us being the body of Christ, well then, everyone is welcome. Nobody's perfect. And tonight, Anything can happen. Anything is possible. Would you stand with me?
question isn't how high have you been able to climb the corporate ladder of God's kingdom. <laughs> the question is, how much of his divine nature have you allowed to work in your life? And here's what I know for sure. The longer we walk this walk, the more of his nature will be in us because his spirit always works. And if at any point in time we've plateaued or we can't seem to climb the ladder we think we're supposed to climb, <laughs> it's not God who is short. And tonight as we open up this altar, there's a place where we can come and we can look in the mirror and we can say, God, I, I think I know where the, the issue might be. And if you've never been to an altar of repentance, it's, it's a place where you can come and you can talk freely to God, where you can tell him what you're thinking, what you're feeling. And if you'll just speak it tonight, if you'll just come and say, God, here's, <laughs> I don't know what this is all about, but I'm feeling something tonight and I think I want to do what's right. If you'll just speak those words tonight in truth, I promise you there's a God that will reveal himself to you in a way that you couldn't possibly imagine. Because anything is possible here tonight. Would you come? <laughs>